Lift up the word and repeat after me. I believe this is the word of God. I believe what God says because it is impossible for God to lie. Now, many of you know that I'm associated with prophecy watchers, and I love Bible prophecy. I think Bible prophecy is something that we all need to understand. And there has been a lot of great teaching these last few years on Armageddon, the tribulation, the second coming of Jesus, the millennium, the Ezekiel 38 wars. So many things have been taught. But somehow I feel that there is tucked away in these prophecies something hidden, something that we know, something that we've been taught, something that we've studied over the years here at this church, but something that basically has been ignored by the prophecy teachers that's been kind of put aside as something that is insignificant, something that is not really all that important compared to everything else. But I will tell you this, that when the disciples came to Jesus on the Mount of Olives and said to him, what is going to be the sign of your coming? And when will you give us some warning about what's going to happen before you set up your kingdom? When they asked him that, his answer had tucked away in it this little, what I call, hidden prophecy. Now we must understand this, when these disciples came to Jesus and said, when are you going to set up your kingdom, they were not asking him, when is going to be the rapture of the church? And I think that is one of the keys in much of the misinterpretation of this passage of Scripture, because many people read this passage of Scripture and they, they take it as though Jesus is talking about what's going to take place at the rapture of the church. But what you need to understand, these were Jewish young men asking the one who said, I am the Messiah. They were asking him, when are you going to set up your kingdom? Now, how do we know they weren't talking about the church? Because at the time they were asking Jesus this, the church did not exist. As strange as it may seem, there was not one single born-again Christian on the face of the earth when Jesus answered this question. The disciples did not have the revelation of the church. In fact, the revelation of the church really didn't come until Paul wrote his letters. And James, and, and some of the things later were mentioned. So what were the disciples talking about? Well, we know, we know now, because we have full revelation of the New Testament Word, we know now that there's going to be a time when the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and the dead in Christ, the ones who are born again believers, will be resurrected. Their bodies will be resurrected, and they will be caught up, those bodies will be caught up into the air. Their spirits, we all know from 1 Thessalonians 5.23 that we are a three-part being. We are spirit, soul, and body. When your body dies, your spirit and soul go to be with the Lord. You're escorted to be with the Lord in paradise. And when Jesus comes back and appears in the sky, your spirit man in a spirit body will appear with Jesus. Your dead body have you passed on. Your dead body will rise out of the ground. Then we who are alive and still remain and have our spirits within us, we get caught up also. And then in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the corruption drops off. 
mortality drops off, we take on incorruption, we take on immortality, our bodies are changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, and from that point on, we go into heaven with Jesus for seven years. And during that seven years, while we are in heaven, we have the judgment seat of Christ, which does not determine your salvation. It's, a, it's an awards ceremony. It's the adorning of the bride. And then we have the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now, Jesus, at that point, has not set up his kingdom yet. When does he set up his kingdom? When does he set up the kingdom that it talks about in the book of Ezekiel? When does he set up his kingdom that it talks about in Zechariah? When does he set up his thousand-year millennial kingdom that it talks about in the book of Revelation? When does he do that? He does that at the end of the seven years when the tribulation has ended. Then he comes back with his army, with his bride, the church, who has been in heaven, had already been trained, had the marriage supper of, of the Lamb, and we then adorned in our white robes, we get on horses, and we head back to earth with him, and he touches down at the end of the seven years on the Mount of Olives. Major geological changes take place on the earth. A lot of things happen. The Antichrist, false prophet, beast, they're all dealt with. And at that point, that's when Jesus sets up his kingdom. Now, we could go farther into what the prophecies are after that, but we'll stop right there today because when Jesus sets up his kingdom, that is the end of that dispensation. That's the end of what they were referring to the age, not the church age, but to the end of the age. That's the end. And at that point, Jesus starts the process of setting up his kingdom. It'll take a while. First of all, he's going to have to call all the nations and all the people of the nations before him. And the ones who followed the Antichrist, who took the mark of the beast and all of that, they get separated out as goats. They go into outer darkness. Those who did not, those who during that seven-year period recognized that Jesus was the Messiah and they did their best to honor him and follow him, even through great persecution, they endured to the end of the tribulation, then they are counted as sheep. And they, in their human bodies, will move into the kingdom and they will populate the earth during the thousand years. That we, the church, in our resurrected glorified bodies, will rule and reign with Jesus over the earth. So, bottom line here. When they were on the Mount of Olives, and the disciples said to him, what's the end of the age, and when are you going to set up your kingdom? They did not have a revelation yet about the tribulation and about the church. So what they were talking about is, when are you going to set up your millennial kingdom that the scriptures said would be set up by the Messiah, and when are you going to start ruling and reigning for a thousand years? So here's what happened. Let's turn in our Bibles to Matthew chapter 24. It says, Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name and say, I am the Christ. I am the Messiah. Uh, that's, that Greek word there, Christos, should be translated Messiah. And will deceive many. So what's this telling us? Now, he is talking about the period just before he sets up his kingdom. These are going to be the signs before he sets up his kingdom. When's he going to set up his kingdom? 
at the end of the seven-year tribulation. So these signs are things that are going to be predominant during the seven years. However, what we must understand is there is a precursor to this. For example, when, when you have a great earthquake on the earth, what happens before the earthquake? There's tremors. And there's seismic things that take place. And geologists can say, okay, the earthquake is coming because we have these signs. So what Jesus is doing is he is giving them signs. And he said, and you, were, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. Now, this has puzzled people for years. Why would he say it's when you say nation against nation and kingdom against kingdom, that's almost like saying country against country and country against country. No, it's not. Because the word for nation and the word for kingdom are two different things. And when it says, and nation will rise against nation, that Greek word there for nation is ethnos. That's where we get the word ethnic. This means that ethnic group will rise against ethnic group. Now look, here's how many races we have in the world today. One. It's the human race. That's what we have. We may be different heights and sizes and shapes and colors and where we live, but we are one blood. We are one nation. We are one race and we are the human race. But Satan will try to divide God's race into smaller groups in order to cause contention, division, and wars. And we see this, and it, it happens more and more. Now, look, in the church, it'll happen less and less. In the church, the church is a glorious church. In our church, in our church I'll be honest with you, I've been pastor here for three decades, and I have not seen racism in this church. I mean, we, we have people from all around the world and all different races, and, and we, don't, we don't have animosity toward each other. But in the world, Jesus said that before he comes, ethnic groups will be coming against ethnic groups. And we've seen this all around the world. Look what Hitler tried to do with the Jews. He tried to wipe out an ethnic group. See, and, and we've seen that in, in various countries over the years. But according to Jesus, before he returns and sets up his kingdom, in other words, during the Great Tribulation, it's going to get really bad. And then there's going to be national groups. Countries against countries. For nation, ethnic group, will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All of these things will increase. And all these things, verse 8, are the beginning of sorrows. They will deliver you up. Now, who's he talking to here? He's talking to a, a group of young Jewish men. He's talking to the Jews here. And they will deliver you up to tribulation and will kill you, and you will be hated by all ethnic groups. You know, anti-Semitism in the world today is just unheard of. It, it's, it's off the charts. It's amazing how many people hate the Jews. Now, we as Christians, as born-again believers, this church and, and the, one, the people we associate, we, we love the Jewish people. We know that the Scripture says those who bless Israel will be blessed and those who curse Israel will be cursed. And let me tell you something. Even a biker knows it's better to be blessed than to be cursed. Right, Chris? Okay, so here's the deal. We, we love the Jews, but there's going to be a time when there will be greater hatred for the Jews than what we even see now. And you say, well, how could that be? I mean, after what Hitler did, Hitler is nothing compared to what's going to take place during the Great Tribulation. 
Jesus pointed it out. He said, you're going to be hated by all ethnic groups, by all nations. And many will, and here is a tucked away little prophecy that we just kind of walk past. And many will be offended. One of the signs of Jesus coming and setting up his kingdom is great offense on the earth. But we see, like the rumblings before an earthquake, we see these things happening before the rapture. We, we see the precursor to all these things before the rapture. Now, granted, God is going to take us out of here. Jesus, Jesus is going to come back and take us out. And as, once again, I get so often accused of just teaching an escape theology. That's right. <laughs> because that's what the Word says. We escape. The church escapes the wrath that is to come. There are many, many, many Scriptures. One of my books, I think I have four or five pages of Scriptures where it just talks about over and over and over again how the church will escape the wrath to come. And then the wrath to come is defined as the great tribulation. So when that trumpet toots and we shoot and we're out of here, all hell's going to break loose on this earth, but we're not going to be here. We're going to be at the marriage supper of the Lamb, at the judgment seat of Christ. We're going to be with the Lord in heaven. And it's, we're going to be having a glorious time. But all of this bad stuff that's happening on the earth as Jesus, Jesus is the one that coined the phrase, the Great Tribulation. All of these things that are going to be happening on the earth, before we're taken out, we're going to see some of these things kind of begin to happen. And I'm telling you as the church, telling myself, I'm telling all of us, do not be associated with any of these things. Do not have one ounce of, of anti-Semitism within you. Do not have hatred for your brother within you. And I will tell you this, do not allow the devil's work of offense to sneak into your heart and get into your life. <clears throat> and we can be offended by so many things. In fact, this message is probably offending somebody. Because, see, when people hear things like this, what, they're do, what they do is they think, I know somebody that really needs this. Well, so do I. You. <laughs> and me. We all need this. Okay. And many will be offended. And what's the result of that? And betray one another and hate one another. Then, after the offense takes place, Many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, and the love of many will grow, grow cold. But he who endures to the end will be saved. I heard a preacher teach one time that all you got to do is just hang on until Jesus comes and when the rapture takes place and you'll be saved. No, that's, that's way out of context. That's not what this is talking about. When he says, if you endure to the end, you'll be saved. Now, now follow me on this. It does not mean if you endure to the end of the tribulation, you'll be born again. If you endure to the end of the tribulation, you'll be part of the church. No. If you endure to the end of the tribulation without taking the mark of the beast, without worshiping the antichrist, false prophet, and the beast, and all of that, without following them, you don't do that, but you believe all of a sudden you realize that Jesus is the Messiah and you stay away from those evil things and you have your allegiance to the Messiah, if you can do that to the end of the tribulation and it will be difficult to do because of all these things taking place. But if you can endure to the end, you will be saved. Saved from what? Saved from hell. Because at, remember, at the end of the tribulation, Jesus brings the nations and the people before him, and he separates the goats and the sheep, 
And if you are not a goat and cast out because you took the mark of the beast, then you will be considered a sheep and you will be saved from hell and you'll be brought into the millennial kingdom and you'll have extended life on earth. Isn't that good? He who endures to the end will be saved. Hmm. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, all ethnic groups, and then the end will come. So the gospel will be preached into all the world. We are doing our best to do that right now. However, we are not promised that the gospel will be preached to all the world until just before the end comes. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? Now, let me read you another scripture, Matthew 24, 29, a little further down. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, so Jesus is still talking here, and he says, after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he, the Father, will send his angels with a great sound of the trumpet, and they will gather together his elect, that is us, from the four winds of heaven, from one end of heaven to the other. So we are collected from one end of heaven to the other? Well, How's that? That's because we've been there for seven years. And then we come back with him. He touches down on the Mount of Olives and sets up his kingdom. Now, what I want to focus on this morning for a few moments is what I call this hidden end time prophecy. This prophecy, and you know, over the years we've talked about this quite a bit. But we need to understand that when we become offended... What we are actually doing is we are taking on the spirit of the Antichrist. We are beginning to act like the way the devil wants us to act and wants the world to act and the way the world will act during the Great Tribulation. In the same way you do not let anti-Semitism into your heart. In the same way that you do not let hatred into your heart. In the same way that you do not let murder and stealing into your heart, you cannot allow offense into your heart. You know, it's, there have been surveys, and I've shared these with you over the years, but you know, 66%, according to Barna Research, 66% of the people that leave churches leave churches because they're offended. They change churches because they're offended. Offended at what? Well, they're offended at the pastor, you know, because... He dresses nice and combs his hair, showers every day. No, they, they can get offended. You can get offended over the craziest things. And we all know the stories. We, you heard about the, the church in Texas, two or 3,000 people in the church, and the church split over the color of the hymnals in the church. One person suggested that they have blue covers, and another one suggested they have red. There's another church in and, and these are true stories. They, they split over the color of the carpet. You know, who, who gives a whodunit about the color of the carpet? It's, it's about the red blood of Jesus. That's, that's what we're concerned about. You know, it, it's, some of these things are just so silly. Now, I recognize sometimes people change for legitimate reasons. Uh, in fact, that, that survey said that 10% of the people quit going to church because they die. Well, you know, there, there's not a whole lot you can do about that, you know. And I think it was 12% of the people left the church because they got a job in another town. And then there's a certain percentage that leaves because of the music. You know, some people like country gospel music at church, and some people like piano, some people like to sing from hymnals, some people want a choir, you know, and some people want a rock and roll band like what we have. Don't we have an amazing worship team, though? I mean, 
our, our, our worship team just takes us to the throne of God. You know, I was talking with one of the worship team members the other day, and I said, um, I said, you're not worship leaders. You guys are lead worshipers. You know, they're, they're not out here trying to get you guys going. No, they just worship God and let you guys follow in worship. I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing. Yeah, it's, we, we have such a great worship team. But Psalm 119, 165, I like this. In the, uh, in the King James Version, it says, Great peace have they which love the law, and nothing shall offend them. In the New King James, it says stumble. Stumble and offense are the exact same word. It's scandal on the same word. And uh, nothing should offend you. If somebody just walks up to you and calls you a dirty name, you, you should just let that roll off. What, what was my dad used to say? Like water off a duck's back. Just don't, don't take it. See, Jesus even said, and I've got scriptures in here. For lack of time, I probably won't be able to get to them right now. But Jesus said, offenses will come. I mean, isn't that a great prophecy? Jesus saying, people are going to be offensive. And they're going to be offensive to you. But see, it's not about whether people are offensive to you or not. It's about whether you take it. See, you, you can take an offense. Have you ever had somebody call you a name? I've had people call me names that wasn't my real name in public. You know, they made up a name. I didn't like it. But you know what? You have a choice. You can either pull out your Glock and whack them good with a bullet, or you can just kind of smile inside and kind of, you know, just don't get offended. You know, Romans 14, 21 says, it is neither, it is good neither to eat meat or drink wine or do anything by which your brother stumbles, that means offended, remember, or is offended, or is made weak. You know, I've heard people say things like, uh, well, you know, the Bible doesn't say anything about drinking. It just talks about getting drunk. So if I want to have a drink, I'll have a drink. And then you invite some people over to your house who don't drink, <clears throat> but you and your righteous holiness say, well, I don't care what they think about it. I'm not sinning. I'm going to have a drink. Well, you know what? The Bible says don't do that. If you have a Jewish neighbor, don't invite him over for a ham sandwich. I mean, come on. We just need to use some common sense sometimes. Gr granted, we shouldn't be offended, but we shouldn't be offensive either. And this whole thing, I don't care what people think. I'm, have you ever heard that? <clears throat> I don't care what people think? Well, you better care what people think. Jesus spent his entire ministry trying to change how people think. Because the Bible says, as a man thinketh in his heart, that's the way he is. So, as Christians, oh, huh. As, as, as Christians, we should care what people think. I've heard pastors say, I don't care what they think. I'm going to preach it. No, come on. I don't care if they all leave. Well, you should care if they all leave because if they're not there, you can't give them the word. Yeah, I remember early on when, about 30 years ago, when this church was actually, this building right here was a gymnasium, had basketball goals on each end. And uh, we still have those stored down in the warehouse, by the way. And... Uh, yeah, I probably shouldn't tell that story. Okay. Well, yeah, I'm going to. <laughs> I, I, rented, I rented this building to start off with, and they didn't want to rent it to me, okay? But they did. In fact, uh, <laughs> when I went to give them the check for the first month's rent, they said, we don't want to take the check because it may be a short rental agreement. And, uh, but then as I was leaving the building, and I'd never really been in this building before, and, 
And this was before we had the $3 million edition. But as I was leaving the building, they came up to me and they said, um, you know, your church is going to be meeting at 1030 and our church is going to be needing it, meeting at 9 o'clock. But this, this may be a little embarrassing, but we don't have a pastor right now. And he said, and we've heard you preach. Can you speak for 30 minutes without doing that healing thing at the end? I said, sure. Because, look, if they're going to let me speak for 30 minutes, why do I have to be offensive? I mean, if that healing thing at the end bothers them, well, then there's a whole lot of other things I can preach on. Are you following me? You know. And so after a couple of weeks, they made me their temporary interim pastor. Lake Community Church. I said, I told them, I said, you do know that temporary and interim are the same thing. So you don't really have to call me the temporary interim pastor. They said, we just want you to know how temporary it really is. <laughs> it's true. It's a true story. Oh. I never will forget Eileen Jean Blair. Bless her heart. I love that lady. She's precious. But uh, she came up to me and I said, uh, how are you doing, Jeannie? She said, all my friends call me Jeannie. You can call me Isla Jean. Boy, I thought my tenure at that church was going to be short. But you know what? We don't have to be offensive to people. If somebody says, I want you to share Jesus, but don't talk about healing. Or I want you to share Jesus, but don't talk about the gifts of the Spirit. You can do that. You don't just have to try to prove something and in your face. Let's be people that are loved and respected. And you know what? If you just teach the Word and if you just love people, it works. Love works. You know that church that met at 9 o'clock that I was temporary interim pastor of? After a few weeks, their church began to grow. Our church began to grow. They gave me a copy of their bylaws. They had one line marked out with a magic marker. I thought, wow. They had that line marked out with a magic marker. I wonder what it said. I held it up to the light. You could read it in the light, you know. It says, we believe speaking in tongues is of the devil. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean at their next service, I just want to speak in tongues to make them upset? No, you don't do that. And what happened? You just keep doing love. And I went from being temporary interim pastor to just the interim pastor. They said, you're no longer our temporary interim pastor. You're now our interim pastor. So I was pastor of two churches here in this building. Pastor of Lake Community Church at 9 o'clock and Walk on the Water Faith Church at 1030. In fact, the local newspaper did an article and said, instead of having a church split, they had a church merge. <laughs> two churches with the same pastor that believed kind of differently. But love does a wonderful thing. Then after a while... I became their pastor. And then after a while, they said, they met with me in a long story, but they met with me and they said, you know, we want to join your church. And 48 of them came in here and lined up and joined our church. They joined our church. One of the ladies looked at Loretta and said, does that mean we speak in tongues now? Loretta said, yes. She goes, okay. <laughs> and, out of that, and out of that group came two spirit-filled pastors of churches. Oh, and, and that night, I asked him, and, and we gave them all walk on the water shirts, you know, with our little logo on it and everything. And... Uh, they gave a testimony that night uh, when the whole, their whole church joined our church. And they said, uh, we have never experienced such love from a congregation. And our congregation and their congregation just kind of began to love each other. And so then I bought the building and here we are. So, praise God. 
You know, um, we, we must guard ourselves against offense. We've got to guard ourselves. Because when we let offense come in, then we start becoming offensive. And what that does is that does the work of the devil. That, that pushes people away. You know, if you act like a jerk at work because you're offended at the boss or somebody you work with, other people are watching you. Other people are watching you. I said, other people are watching you. I mean, I'm shocked when I go through a checkout line 100, 150 miles from here, and as I'm getting my receipt at this gas station or store or wherever, someone says, bless you, pastor. Think, how'd they know? People are watching you. People you don't know are watching you are watching you. And you may be the only Jesus they ever encounter. So you cannot be offensive, but you cannot allow things to offend you because people see it when you get offended. And you know what? People don't like that. Nobody wants to hang around an offended person. You know, people who are having trouble getting friends, one of the things they should probably look at is, am I touchy? Am I, am I offended at what people say? Are, are people kind of, as my, my mother would say, are they scared to say anything to me because they might say something wrong? We need to examine ourselves because that prophecy right there about many people will become offended in the end of days is right in there with anti-Semitism. It's right in there with hating your brother. I tell you what, offense, becoming offended, is a big deal to Jesus. And it is a tool that the enemy will use during the tribulation, but we're going to see an increase of it beforehand, just like the tremors of an earthquake. So, say this, I will not be offended regardless of what the pastor says. All right. See, because offended people sometimes are prideful people. Have you ever met somebody that was just never wrong? Quit looking at the person next to you. Come on now. Have, have you, are you never wrong? Hmm. Romans 12, 16 says, Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things but associate with the humble. Are you too good to hang out with certain people? Do not be wise in your own opinion. It didn't say don't be wise. It's don't be wise in your own opinion. That's thinking a little higher of yourself. Huh. Luke 151 says, He has shown strength with His arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. There's nothing wrong with being exalted as long as you allow the Lord to exalt you. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and He will lift you up. There's nothing wrong with being lifted up as long as it's not you lifting yourself up. Hmm. You know... Um, and right now, uh, you know, we've, we've reached, uh, we're just a few, few views away from 2 million views on YouTube for the church. Really, 2 million. And some of these views are from services and meetings that were years ago. And there's probably going to be people who will listen to this. And this message of offense will offend them. And you say, well, how could that be? Well, because some people will say, well, who does he think he is? Who does he think he is? Well, you know, that's what happened with Jesus. Jesus went into Nazareth, his hometown. He grew up there. We've been there. You know, we, he grew up there. 
And he preached the same gospel that he preached in Capernaum and every place else. But the people of Nazareth said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Don't we know this guy? I mean, what was Jesus, 31, 32 years old? Don't we know this guy? I mean, he grew up just down the street. We, we know his mama. We know his brothers and sisters. Who does he think he is coming in here and telling us he's the big Messiah guy? And the Bible says, and they became offended at him. And that is the only place in the New Testament where people couldn't get healed. And Jesus was there. It says, they became offended at him. And because of their offense, only a few minor miracles took place. And what did Jesus do? It says, and the next verse says, he just, he just continued on his circuit preaching. See, and that's what you've got to do. There's going to be times when you present the truth. You may be talking to a friend and you present the truth about something and they don't like your wisdom and they get offended. Well, sometimes you just need to do what Jesus did and move on. You know, uh, you've heard the phrase, quit kicking a dead horse. Sometimes Satan will use a person to distract you your entire life. You may work your life. Now, there's times when you're supposed to, but you've got to be led by the Holy Spirit. And there are people who are time wasters. Your time's valuable. All right. So, um, you know, offended people are co constantly trying to prove something. Jealousy, envy, pride, they all associate together. Hmm. Ephesians 4.26 says, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. When, when you get upset with people, you're giving place to the devil. Jesus said in Matthew 16.11, or excuse me, Matthew 11.6, He said, Blessed is he who is not offended because of me. As, as Jesus was perfect, and people got offended. So, when people get offended at you, the one thing that you, of course you need to examine yourself, but don't get stuck in the rut of thinking, what did I do? What did I do? And then spiral down because you can't figure out what it was you did. You know, <laughs> Once again, as my family would say, maybe you didn't did anything. My family's hillbillies, by the way, just in case you're wondering. Hmm. All right. Eighty to ninety percent. And I got this off the internet, so you know it's true. Eight, Eighty to ninety percent of all. Modern illnesses, Doc, you're going to love this, are psychosomatic. That doesn't mean that we imagine them, but it means that they are possibly induced by the way we think. Loretta and I personally know a person who pretended to have an ailment so that they could get insurance. In fact, I went to pray for this gentleman in the grocery store one time, politely pray for him. I wasn't going to get the charismatic grip on his head and throw him against the canned corn or anything, you know. I was just, just going to politely pray for him. And I reached out my hand and I said, I'm going to pray for you. And as I went like this, his wife slapped my hand away in the grocery store. Just slapped my hand. Don't you pray for him because he might get healed and we need the money. Well, he was, he was faking the illness anyway, I found out later. But the illness he was faking, Doc, came upon him and he died from it. So, here's what we need to understand. If 80 to 90% of all modern illnesses have psychosomatic roots, then that means this, what you think affects you greatly. Physically, your lifestyle, 
And you need to start thinking, I am not going to be offended. I mean, if somebody calls you a name, somebody, somebody waves at you in that special way that people wave, telling you that you're number one in their life. It doesn't matter. It, it, honestly, it doesn't matter. Okay. Proverbs 18, 19 says this, an offended brother is harder to win than a strong city. That's why you can't be offensive at people. Because you offend somebody, you've separated them. They're not going to listen to you. They're not going to listen to the truth. Hmm. All right. Let's go to Matthew 24, 10. Matthew 24, 10. We're going to take one more look at this hidden prophecy tucked away in amongst all these, quote, big prophecies. Let me tell you something. This is a big prophecy too. Jesus said, and then many will be offended and betray one another and will hate one another. Betrayal and hatred will follow offense. And offenses grow. Offenses grow. Now, over the years, I have an illustration that I have given here at the church, according to Chris over here. I have given it probably 74 times. Well, today I'm going to give it the 75th time, and we're going to close with it. Now, Chris, by the way, who's kind of like head of all the Christian bikers of the world, uh, I mean, you can't go on the Internet without finding... You know, him riding on his bike saying Jesus loves you. You know, it's just, it's everywhere. But with his wife, she, I didn't mean to offend you by leaving you out. Okay, you know. And all the other Christian bikers. What was I talking about? Oh, Chris, Chris told me one time, he said, he said, you know that story you told about whatever? I said, yeah. He said, well, you didn't tell it quite right. He said, I know that it was your story and you lived it, but I can tell it better than you because I've heard it so many times, he said. <laughs> All right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close with this. Many of you, Chris, have heard this many times. But in uh, National Geographic did a, 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 a documentary one time about how in this native country uh, they needed to capture monkeys, and uh, I'm not sure exactly what they used them for, uh, for food, or I've heard that monkey brain tastes really good. Uh, I haven't had any knowingly, you know, although I have ate at McDonald's, but I don't, I haven't, <laughs> I haven't knowingly had monkey brain, let, let's put it that way. But for some reason, the natives wanted to catch monkeys, and the way they captured the monkeys is, and they show this video, they had these cages that were probably, oh, I would say, four foot square, about this tall. They were solid on the top, solid on the bottom. And they had uh, bars all the way around them, metal bars of some sort. And the bars were about this far apart. And what they did is inside of that cage, they, they put uh, a shiny object that attracted the monkeys. And so they, they lined these cages up, they put the shiny objects in there, and then the natives went back over the hill. And the monkeys, which were in plenty, <laughs> kind of like the kangaroos in Australia. We ate at a restaurant there, and there's just kangaroos looking in the window, you know. <laughs> so at any rate, they, they, they went over the hill. Well, the monkeys came over the hill, and they wanted that shiny thing. And so they would stick their hand through the bars, and they would grab hold of the shiny thing, which was a, a bait stick. It's what they called a bait stick. And the shiny thing was made in such a way that it wouldn't come out through the bars. I mean, it was in there, but it wouldn't come through the bars. So the monkey would reach in, grab the shiny thing, and try to get it out, and couldn't get it out. But the monkey wanted that shiny thing so bad that even when the natives started coming over the hill with clubs, and they're, they're going to they're gonna get the monkeys, okay, no matter how close they got with their clubs to hit the monkeys. The monkeys, they would scream. Scream like a monkey would scream. Yeah, there we go. There. 
Yeah, there it is. Yeah, that's good. Do it again. Okay, all right. So the monkeys were screaming, but they wouldn't let go. They wanted it so bad they wouldn't let go. And so the, the natives came over the hill and just whacked them and killed them. Now here's the deal. That bait stick, that bait stick in that cage, the Greek word for bait stick is scandalon. And that word scandalon in our Bibles is translated as offense. And what we see is people, they reach in and they grab hold of the offense, the bait stick. And no matter what happens, they're not going to let go of it. And because they won't let go of it, they get destroyed. Are you following me? They get destroyed. Now, how hard is it to get away so that you're not destroyed? You just let go of the bait stick and run. Well, that's what people need to do with a fence. You need to let go of it and run. But sometimes that bait stick is so shiny and you, and you identify with it and it becomes your lifestyle. You just, no matter what happens, you won't let go. You've got to let go. You've got to let go of the offense. And if you don't, you're falling right into the trap and the future motives and desires of the Antichrist. Because he's going to use offense in the same way he uses wars and rumors of wars and hatred. During the tribulation before Jesus comes, he's going to use offense. Don't allow yourself to get caught up in it. It's the work of the devil. All right? Stand up. Now, here's what we're going to do. Hold your hand like this. Pretend, now I know that none of you people have any offenses whatsoever, but this is just for the thousands of people watching. You know, nobody in this room has any offenses whatsoever. Okay. So, but pretend you have an offense towards somebody or a group of people. You may even have an offense toward a company or, or a neighborhood or an association or a bank. or you, Who knows? Just offended. And you talk about it all the time. What we're going to do right now is we're just going to say, I'm letting go of it. I'm letting go of it. I don't, I don't need that. I don't need that in my life. And you know what? You say, it can't be that simple. It is. The thing that would have saved the monkey's life would be if they just said, okay, and ran off. They had plenty of time to do it. But they saw the natives coming over the hill. And, well, they wouldn't let go. They saw them getting closer. They wouldn't let go. And the natives were right there with the clubs, going to whack the monkeys, and they just wouldn't let go. So, if you ever wonder what happened to the monkeys back in the 60s? <laughs> okay, all right. So, so <laughs> I'm a believer. <laughs> okay. Repeat after me. I will let go of the bait stick. I will not look for it after I let it go. I am not going to pick up a fence. I'm going to live clean from it. And no offense can offend me. Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you all the glory. We give you all the praise. I thank you, Father, that we have decided to be offense-free so that we will not fall into that end-time prophecy of being offended. Bless these, your people. In the name of Jesus, amen.